All right. With that, I give you Brother Mark Whitaker. I've just realized the irony of my first title. Uh, given the accent that you're about to be subjected to for the next <laughs> 45 minutes or so. Anyway, I don't think I, I, don't think I need introductions in this room because uh, you, you know already I'm, I'm the short one um, <laughs> compared to everybody else who's been up on stage so far. Uh, so here we go. Um, this, this is a series uh, that, that kind of is what it says on the tin. Uh, we're going to look at things that Jesus said where maybe it's uh, maybe they're a bit puzzling, maybe it's not that obvious what Jesus meant, maybe we think it's obvious what he meant, but I'm going to disabuse you of that over the course of this week and we're going to look at some different meanings to what Jesus had to say. Um, but well, I want to start off with a, with a, a question for you, brothers and, and sisters and young people. And the, the question is this, okay, you've, uh, you've been given the opportunity to, to preach, to share the gospel message with people who haven't heard it. How are you going to go about that? Are you going to choose uh, to, to preach the message with the greatest clarity that you possibly can, or are you going to talk to people in a way that's so obscure that they have no idea what you're talking about? Well, that's a dumb question, isn't it? <laughs> because, of course, every, every one of you, if you get the opportunity to preach to people, the one thing you do is you try and keep it simple, don't you? You try and make sure that the person you're talking to understands exactly what you're saying to them. And yet, it appears in that reading we did way back at breakfast time this morning in Matthew 13 that that is not the approach that the Lord Jesus takes. So open your Bibles please, uh, Matthew 13, that's where we're going to stay um, for most of this, this morning, um, apart from a little diversion into Isaiah, and look at what the Lord Jesus does here. Matthew 13 and verse 1. It says, On the same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea, and great multitudes were gathered together to him, so that he got into a boat and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. Jesus uh, delivers his message to the crowd there in parables. And it is interesting, you know, that it's interesting that Matthew makes this point to us that Jesus sits down there and he's now going to talk to the people as he does through this chapter in parables. It's almost as if as if Matthew's saying to us, you know, this is the first time that the Lord Jesus does this. Now he's teaching people in parables. And yet it isn't. You know, you only have to go back a chapter, and there's a bit of parables there. And uh, if you go right back to the Sermon on the Mount, you know, one of the early times Jesus teaches, Jesus does quite a bit of teaching in parables in the Sermon on the Mount. So why, why, does, why does Matthew bother to say it now, given it's already happened in Matthew's own record? Why does he say Jesus teaches them in parables? Well, I'm going to give you a, a couple of options, uh, because I'm like that. Um, and I think the, the first one is, uh, is perhaps this. That, that when we go back to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5 to 7, uh, that message in that sermon from the Lord Jesus is to people who are already disciples of the Lord Jesus. I mean, that's how the, that's how the Sermon on the Mount starts. It says, Seeing the multitudes, he went upon a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and he taught them. Now, what, what's, what's important about that? Well, because those people that he gives the Sermon on the Mount to are his disciples, remember, and he starts by teaching them, blessed, blessed, blessed are they, teaching people who follow him. Whereas by now, in Matthew 13, he, he's speaking now to a great multitude, that's how it describes it, and they're not all his disciples, not by any stretch. 
This, this multitude now gathered on the seashore includes many people who are enemies of Jesus, not just followers. So there's, there's one option. That's maybe why it, it says Jesus is going to teach these people in parables. There's something about the audience that's different this time, that's being pulled out. But also, um, you know, when you go right back to the Sermon on the Mount, all the, the little parables that Jesus teaches there, you know, when you compare them to what Jesus is going to go on and say in Matthew 13, those ones in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, they're really very easy. They're very straightforward to understand. That I, I've said here, they're more like metaphors or similes that the Lord Jesus uses there, where he, he uses a, a tiny little parable just to make things even clearer to his followers. Um, have I got some examples? Yeah, like these. You are the salt of the earth. You know, you're, you're something that's there to flavour and to preserve. But if the salt loses its flavour, how shall it be seasoned? It's then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill can't be hidden. You know, when Jesus uses a you know, tiny little parable like that, you and I can grasp almost immediately the point that the Lord Jesus is, is trying to get over there. He, he actually uses them to clarify what he's saying, to make it memorable to his listeners, rather than to, uh, to shroud it in mystery. These, these things, they, they don't make the teaching of Jesus more mysterious, do they? They, they add, a, they add even, even more clarity to it. And, and it's not like that, is it, brothers and sisters? When, when we get to Matthew 13, because when we get to Matthew 13 and the, the parallel passages in, in Mark and Luke, it, it seems that from this point onwards, Jesus now systematically uses parables to give his teachings, and those parables, well, the, the meaning of them is not quite so readily understandable anymore. In fact, in, in a way, that's confirmed for us. If you uh, just flick over to verse 34 in Matthew 13, it says to us that all these things, Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables, and without a parable, he did not speak to them. This is a, is a very, very deliberate policy that the Lord Jesus is now embarking on. That's why it said at the beginning of the chapter, Jesus started to teach them in parables. It's Matthew saying, this is it from now on. For this audience, everything is going to be in parables. So why does Jesus do that? That's my question from the beginning. You know, if you, if you were setting out to convert people to the gospel message and the, the things Jesus wanted to teach them, why did Jesus use a method that would actually confuse most of the people who were listening to him? Uh, that's not just my question. That was the question the apostles asked as well. Uh, look at that in verse 10 of Matthew 13. He, all he's done is teach the parable of the sower, and his disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? You know, they, they're as, com as confused as, uh, as everybody else is. You know, they're perplexed about why, uh, why is it that, that Jesus is, is, is seeming to, uh, to com compound things? By, uh, by telling his message in parables. And, and actually, Jesus, by way of an answer to them, kind of makes it worse. Because Jesus says to them, well, I'm doing this because I actually, I actually want to divide my audience up. Um, it's there in verse 11, isn't it? He answered and said to them, because it's been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them... It has not been given. So, so Jesus says, I, I'm doing this very deliberately. This isn't just because I've learned some new kind of technique in teaching school. I'm doing this very deliberately. I am choosing a method of teaching that, uh, that will divide my audience up, um, that will deny understanding to the, the, the largest proportion of my audience. Jesus says some, some of my audience are going to be privileged to understand it. 
even though, even though uh, they're only going to understand it because Jesus is going to explain it all to them later. Um, that's, this is how Mark sort of uh, records part of this chapter. It says, With many such parables he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it, but without a parable he did not speak to them. And when they were alone, he explained all things to his disciples. You see, even the disciples didn't get it. But at least they had Jesus afterwards to say, right, now I'll tell, I'll tell you what I really meant now. But all the others, everybody else in that audience that Jesus was talking to, were denied enlightenment from the Son of God. Now, do you not, do you not think that seems quite harsh? That the Lord Jesus Christ there... Uh, is, is, is choosing to reveal the truth and what's there in his message to only a very small group of people, those that he gathers around him afterwards. But, but for others, the message is completely hidden because of the medium that Jesus chooses to use. He chooses a medium that leaves most of the people a bit like yourselves now with this accent going... What, what was all that about? I have no idea. So, this is, this is why I've got this theme. What did, what did Jesus really mean by doing this? What, why is Jesus using this approach? I think the answer, brothers and sisters, lies, and you're going to get fed up of me saying this this week, it lies in the context of what is happening at this point in the ministry. It's always good to look at context, isn't it? Let's read a bit about around this, this chapter itself. And, and here's our context. Um, first of all, you know, we're well on in the ministry of the Lord Jesus now. And opposition to the things that Jesus said and the things that Jesus did is building all the time. In fact, the, the religious leaders are really upping the ante uh, against the Lord Jesus here. Just go back into chapter 12, uh, and what have we got? We're going to look at this later in the week. Verse 24 of chapter 12. Now, when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. This guy is, is in league with the devil. Uh, verse 38... Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. We aren't going to believe you without, without a sign. Well, they're going to get a sign in, in a minute. So there's, there's opposition to Jesus. But also, I think one of the things we can see as we look at this context is that the, the audience Jesus has got here, probably also like yourselves at this point in the morning, they're no longer so enthusiastic anymore. This isn't the audience of the Sermon on the Mount. You know, we're a year or two on now. And, uh, well, look at, look at what this audience is like. Look at verse 41 of chapter 12. This is what Jesus says to these people. He says, The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. That's Jesus pointing at them and saying, well, you know, the Ninevites are going to condemn you lot because they repented. You, you haven't. You see the, the implied criticism from the Lord Jesus there. No, they're not that enthusiastic at all, are they? Uh, what else have we got? Um, well, even, even the Lord Jesus' own family are not that supportive of him, are they? Just go to the very end of chapter 12. The last thing that happens before we get into 13, verse 47. One said to him, Look, your, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak with you. And we know what Jesus responds. I hope I'm not treading on uh, Brother Sean's toes here at all. But look at, the, look at the very last verse. Jesus says, Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. And of course, implied in that statement is my own brothers and sisters and mother at the moment are not doing the will of my Father in heaven. So, you know, his, his family weren't, they weren't completely on board either, either were they at this point. 
So, you know, when you look at that context in, in chapter 12, what we can see is that this, this audience, this massive crowd that have gathered around Jesus now, are, are less supportive than they had been in the past. I guess what we've got more here is more of his opponents, more scribes, more Pharisees, more of those folks, more, I'm going to call them agnostics, people who were choosing to sit on the fence instead of follow Jesus. Um, these are the people who, uh, who, who came along because, well, there was an off chance they might get fed. And of course, that's what we'll see in the next chapter, isn't it? Chapter 14, we'll see the feeding of... 5,000. That tells us they were only there for, for the food. Certainly after it they were. Even, um, e even the, the way that the other Gospels describe this crowd is, uh, bears out this sort of analysis that we're building up of them. Uh, because in Mark 4, Jesus talks about the other people as those who are outside. Um, Luke's even more harsh. He just says the rest. Yeah, that's, that's when Jesus says, to you has been given the mysteries, the rest, those outside, they're, they're not going to understand. So I think, brothers and sisters, straight away, in, in trying to answer this question, you know, why is Jesus going to use parables now, we can assume that from at this point on in the ministry, the majority of those in Jesus' audience you know, that they may not actually be that keen to, to hear or to believe. They're there for the spectacle, they're there for the food, they're there for the healing, they're there because they want to pull Jesus off his, uh, off his pedestal. But there's, a, there's something else as well that's, that's worth us noting. And it's uh, and back in chapter 13 again, and it's, uh, and it's verse 12. Because Jesus carries on and he says, For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Right, brothers and sisters, this is my only bit of interaction because I ain't a teacher. Um, where else do we have that statement? Whoever has more will be given, and he that doesn't have will have even what he thought he had taken away. What, where does that come you don't have to give me chapter and verse, just parable of the talents, thank you. That's, I'm glad I didn't have to do that wait time thing, because I, I, you know, nature abhors a vacuum and so do I. Um, but you're right, it's, um, it's in that, that contrast that we have in the parable of the talents. You know, the talent was taken from him, the, the one talent man, and given to him, give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he'll have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And you've, the, the contrast is being painted by the Lord Jesus there, isn't it? Between, between what? Between the good and faithful servant, the one who believed in what his master was about, and who did what his master asked on the one hand. And he's given more. But on the other hand, of course, there's, how does he describe him? Wicked and lazy servant who had been given a talent and yet had done nothing with it. You know, the, the very fact that Jesus uses the same phrase in that parable as he does back here in Matthew 13 suggests to me that Jesus is faced with the same kind of audience the same kind of audience divided into two. You know, there were those men and women who truly valued the man and his message. You know, and they were doing something with the talent. But on the other hand, there were those who did not value it at all. And so even, even what they thought they had was being taken away from them. They thought they knew what Jesus was about, but now he's going to close the door on their understanding. And Jesus does something now to, to support the fact that he's teaching them in parables. He says, well, this is why I'm doing it. I'm doing it because I'm dividing my audience, because my audience is divided into two parts. And he says, you know, this is, this is what Isaiah spoke about. So, if you don't mind, keep a finger in Matthew. Go back to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah 6. Because this is, this is the Lord Jesus quoting from when Isaiah... Remember, Isaiah saw the glory of the Lord in the temple, 
And he said, I'm a man of unclean lips. I live in a nation of unclean lips. Remember, remember that thought from the, from the prophet. Uh, God cleanses him. And, um, and then God says, who am I going to send? Isaiah says, send me. What's the message? Well, the message was, sorry, I, I know you've gone to Isaiah. You kept a finger in Matthew, didn't you? Good. Please go back to Matthew and let's just see how Jesus quotes it first of all. Because um, what Jesus quotes from Isaiah is this. Uh, verse 13 of Matthew 13. He says, Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says... Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive, for the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. Now, you know that the way the way that quotation from Isaiah reads in Matthew. The way it reads is as if, as if this is all the people's doing. You know, they've been hearing, but they, they can't hear. They've, it's, it's their own fault. They've, they've allowed their hearts to grow dull. They've allowed their ears to become hard of hearing. You know, it's, it's, all, the, it's all the people's fault here that they've become unresponsive to the, uh, the message from God. Now you can turn to Isaiah again. Because the way the words are put in Isaiah, um, actually Isaiah is a bit more forthright than that and a bit harsher in what he says. Because here's the quotation in verse 9 of Isaiah 6. He said, Go and tell this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. And this is God then speaking to Isaiah. Make the heart of this people dull and their eyes heavy and shut their eyes, sorry, their ears heavy and shut their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. It's a subtle difference, isn't it? But what Isaiah is told by God is not the people are going to have dull hearts and, and, and heavy ears and, and closed eyes. Isaiah is told, make this people's heart dull. Make their ears heavy. I, I, Isaiah is actually being told by God to be the one to, to, to make his people even less responsive. To make them unable to understand the message from God so that they can't respond anymore you know and you and I sort of think about that and go what uh, wasn't, wasn't the purpose of the prophet to, uh, to tell people a clear message so that they would repent like the preacher teaching the gospel. Isn't, isn't that what it's about? Why is Isaiah told, I tell you what, says God, I want you to go out and make people not understand what you say. Well, that, you know, that's what's been told there. Why would God say that to Isaiah? Why would he say, make it uh, an unintelligible message? That's my big word for the morning. Well, the reason is, brothers and sisters, because, because the people had already closed their ears and their eyes. They'd already turned away from God. And that's, that's actually, again, context tells us that. You go back a chapter in Isaiah, and uh, what do we read back in chapter, just chapter 5, verse 18, for example. This is describing these people he's going to talk to. Woe to those who draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin as if with a cart rope that say, let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it. Let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw near and come that we may know it. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. He says at the end of verse 24, because they have rejected the law of the Lord of hosts 
and despise the word of the Holy One of Israel. You know, this, this is a nation who had already gone, gone far away from their God. And it's as if when we get to Isaiah 6 that God says through Isaiah, okay, you, you don't want to listen to me? Fine, I'm going to give a message then that, you, that even if you wanted to, you won't, you won't be able to listen to it anymore. I'm going to condemn you because you're so far away from me and you won't even realise I'm condemning you. The only people who will realise that the prophet's words are condemnation are those who actually want to hear a, a faithful remnant. And actually they're, they're going to respond. And it, you, that's what you get at the end of chapter 6 in, in Isaiah. Look at how he carries on. Uh, verse 11 of chapter 6. You know, I'm going to give this unintelligible message. Then I said, verse 11, Lord, how long? And he said, until the cities are laid waste and without inhabitant, the houses are without a man, the land is utterly desolate, and the Lord has removed men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. But yet, a tenth will be in it, and will return and be for consuming, as a terebinth tree or as an oak, whose stump remains when it's cut down, so the holy seed shall be its stump. And there's the contrast again. Verse 11 and 12, you've got the wicked, those who, who chose not to listen to God. They'd never been listening. They had no interest in God. Uh, and so would not be able to understand the message when it came. And God says, you'll be scattered. Only a faithful remnant, just like the stump of a tree, only the faithful remnant will, will listen and heed, take heed and, and be saved. And what the Lord Jesus is doing, you know, back in Matthew 13, the Lord Jesus is saying to his disciples, he's saying, you know, that prophecy, that little vision there that, that Isaiah had in, in Isaiah chapter 6, which was partially fulfilled in his day, in what Isaiah himself did, that message is now being fully filled in what the Lord Jesus is doing himself. Oh dear. Here's a, let, here's, I just wanted to think of the, how this is being, all of Isaiah 6 is being fulfilled again. In front of the people of Israel is, is a man who is revealing to them the glory of the Lord. That's how Isaiah 6 is, starts, isn't it? With the glory of the Lord being revealed in the temple. And actually John, John uh, 6 tells us that, sorry, John 12 tells us that, that's the Lord Jesus in glory. Um, it, and in chapter 6 of Isaiah, we've got a man who is clean, and because he's clean, he's separate from the, the uncleanness of the nation around him. Uh, and yet already by chapter 6, the nation has rejected his message. You know, we saw that in chapter 5, didn't we? They, they, they weren't interested in what Jesus had to say. They, they don't want to come to the Lord Jesus. They, they prefer the obscurity of, of darkness, which Isaiah is going to go on and prophesy against them. And because that's what they prefer, they prefer darkness, then the Lord Jesus comes along and he says, well, I'm going to do what Isaiah said I was going to do. I'm going to draw a veil over your eyes. I'm going to make your ears heavy so you can't, you can't hear me, you can't see what I'm trying to show you. You can't understand in your heart. And that's what Jesus does with his parables. Jesus uses a medium of teaching that will just make everything dark and obscure to them. It means nothing to his audience. And on, only a faithful remnant, only the few, the disciples who, who uh, want to really know. So it's only those who, like the apostles in, in verse 10 of Matthew, who say, what, what, was, you know, what was that actually about? What does this parable mean? It's only them, with a genuine uh, thirst for understanding of the Lord's message, who actually get the benefit of it and are able to repent. Now, brothers and sisters, you might think that's quite an unusual thing. I have no idea how I'm going for time. Okay, yeah. go with that. Um, you might think this is, this is quite unusual, that the Lord Jesus is doing that, and he's fulfilling what Isaiah did 700 years before. But do you know, this kind of thing happens again and again in Scripture. You know, once I start putting these up on the screen, you will, uh, you'll, you'll recognize the pattern. 
it's a pattern where where when people turn away from God and they set themselves against God and they say to God, we are not interested in your message or what you have to say or what you offer, there comes a point where God says, all right, then I'll stop trying. You don't want to listen, then I will make the message one that you can't listen to. Here's, here's a few examples. Pharaoh. Remember through the early plagues, Pharaoh hardened his heart, Pharaoh hardened his heart, Pharaoh hardened his heart, and then eventually God says, fine, I'll harden your heart. And that's what happens at the end, isn't it? Those who turn away from God, eventually God completely turns away from them. King Saul, he's another one. Uh, you know, tried to serve God at first, but when he, when he wholeheartedly turned away from God, then God says, fine. And God sends a distressing spirit to, uh, to him, to, uh, to, to trouble him. You know, it's the same thing happening again. Um, Paul recounts the way this was happening in Old Testament times in Romans 1. Uh, and this is referring, I think, mainly to God's people Israel. He says, professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonour their bodies among themselves. They turned away from God and ultimately God says, fine, you, I'll help you along that, that road to destruction if that's, if that's what you absolutely want. Paul writes again in, in 2 Thessalonians and he's talking about future times. Maybe we see this in our world today. He says, for this reason... God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You see the same pattern there. You know, those who, who say to God, I'd rather, I'd rather go the way of unrighteousness, I don't want to believe the truth. God says, fine, I'm going to give you some rubbish to believe in them. I'm going to, I don't know, I'll bury some fossils or whatever. You know, God gives them reason to, uh, to believe the lie because that's what they want to believe and, uh, and the delusion is, is strong for them. You see, it's, it's quite a common theme actually, isn't this, in Scripture that, uh, that when, when men and women shut the door on God and God's ways, ultimately God then shuts the door on them. And that's, that's exactly, that's the point we've reached in the Lord's ministry here, um, that those who deliberately and constantly oppose the Lord Jesus, they find that the Lord Jesus himself closes the door of understanding on them, lest they be saved. And it, the interesting thing for, for you and me is, is we, can, we can see this actually happening in, in the gospel narrative. Um, the, the thing about you and me is because we, we've got the scriptures and we've got the explanation of the parable of the sower, for us, we can read the parables and we can understand most of the time at least the, the key principles that the Lord Jesus is saying. Sometimes we can kind of really get beneath the skin, can't we? We have eyes and we can see. But these people listening to Jesus, they, they didn't get it. You know, even the parable of the sower... Until Jesus explained it to his apostles, it was a closed book to them. It was, like, it was a story about farming. But, but, uh, but for the scribes and the Pharisees, you know, these, these men were the, the great minds of Israel. They were, the, they were the religious leaders. They had no idea what Jesus' message was about. In fact, the, the, the parable we look at tomorrow, you'll see that at the end of that parable, they get completely the wrong end of the stick. In so doing, unfortunately, they give us the wrong end of the stick as well. But more of that tomorrow. But they, they never understand a parable that Jesus teaches until one of the very last ones. And it's the, uh, the parable of the, uh, the, the wicked husbandman um, in the vineyard. And at the end of that parable, after Jesus has said he will destroy those wicked husbandmen and give the, uh, the vineyard to others... It says the chief priests and the scribes that very hour sought to lay hands on him, but they feared the people, for they knew he had spoken this parable against them. 
That's the first time in the last few days of the Lord Jesus' ministry that they actually got it. I think the only reason they get it is because Jesus uses a parable from Isaiah 5, doesn't he? It was a closed book to them. But to those men and women who did choose to really listen, who wanted to understand, who responded to the Lord Jesus during his ministry, while well, the door was well and truly opened for them. Look at, look at Matthew 13 again, and how Jesus contrasts the disciples with the quote that he's just given them from Isaiah. He says in verse 16, But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For assuredly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. And, and you know, we, we might think that the Lord Jesus is harsh when we first start reading this stuff and think, well, you know, he's closing the door, that maybe somebody with there was going to listen. But actually, for those who did want to listen, here we can see that the, the true and the abundant generosity of, of the Master towards those people. You know, these were men and women who did want to be saved, who were seeking salvation. And, and Jesus says, you, you are seeing and hearing something that surpasses what even the greatest prophets in the Old Testament experienced. Now I want you to think about that, just don't think for too long. The greatest prophets in the Old Testament, Moses on Mount Sinai. Think of what he experienced. Isaiah in the temple, he saw the Lord lifted up. Jeremiah, uh, throughout his ministry, the experiences he had. Ezekiel, Remember the glory of the Lord revealed to Ezekiel and the things that he saw, Daniel, and, and all his visions. Even those men did not experience what, uh, what, what these people did, these, these common men, you know, out of Galilee. I never realized Galilee was rich. I thought these were all poor guys. But, you know, these, these men experienced so much more. Ah, but that's, that's not the best bit, is it, of course, brothers and sisters? Because you and I, today, we have the same, exactly the same benefit as they had. As long as we are responsive to the Master, as long as you and I are prepared to open the message and to listen to what the Lord Jesus says with, with a receptive mind, we too will see and hear what many prophets and righteous men desired to hear. You think of that, that when you open the pages of Scripture, we are seeing, we're seeing something that Moses would have loved to see and didn't. So, think of that, and, uh, and it's a wonder, isn't it? Here's, a, here's what Isaiah says um, in chapter 42. This is uh, this really this is the Lord God speaking to his servant to the to the Lord Jesus but through the words of Isaiah and he says I the Lord have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people for a light of the gentiles to open the blind eyes to bring out the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. And that's you and me uh, that's being listed there in that chapter. You know, we're not, the, we're not the great and the good of the world, are we, brothers and sisters? We're not those who have eyes but can't see. We're not those who have ears and, and can't hear. R rather, we, we are those who acknowledge our blindness, aren't we? We are those who appreciate that we were bound in prison and are, are overjoyed to have been led out of that prison house into freedom, brought out of prison by the Lord Jesus. We have had our eyes opened by the, the gospel message to, to, to see the light of the glory of God 
in the face of Jesus Christ and to be able to see what the Lord Jesus wants to teach us. And, and hopefully, brothers and sisters, as we, uh, as we go through this week, we will, uh, we will look at some other challenging, uh, some odd things that the Lord Jesus says uh, in his, uh, well, very often in his other parables. And we will be blessed uh, in what we look at with, with eyes to see and with ears to hear. It's not often that, uh, it's very rare in fact that I sit down with five minutes to go. <laughs>